All right, welcome back. This is uh, Community Economics and Agriculture, and we are digging into the reading, um, Does Community Have a Value by Wendell Berry? So I think it might be helpful to start with this, to think about these do diff different domains, the economy, community, and agriculture, and nature, and um, understand that Barry's trying to get us to think about the relations between these and the extent to which these circles should or can be overlapping. So one of his key points is that um, the economy um, in most rural areas has become something that's very distinct from the, um, the community in that uh, the community no longer really functions as, as a close uh, interworking set of um, operations in the farmland, in the rural space, that it's pretty much an extractive economy where you're just producing these commodities for this larger global market. And so there's not the kind of intricate uh, relationship between community and economy that you used to have. And in this particular essay, he doesn't talk a ton about um, the nature of agriculture and how that relates to these two things, but we're going to draw some of that out as we go through it. So his basic suggestion is they should be more harmonious, and it's helpful to think about uh, Barry as an agrarian voice. So he's kind of, he's a social critic, but he's one that's located in the local space um, in the country. And so he kind of has a different perspective on the world than um, those of us that um, tend to think of ourselves um, as people who get food from the grocery store and live in cities. Our lecture outline here we're going to talk through, just remind ourselves about this ideal of attunement that we've um, taken from earlier um, portions of the course. Um, we're going to look at the historic situation that Barry sets up with Lois and Owen Flood. Um, talk about how that disappeared uh, and what he finds valuable in the Amish local community or the local economy and the um, potential of solidarity and then we're going to hit just a few ideas about sustainable ag practices. Okay, so we might remember earlier in the course when we encountered Wes Jackson, um, he had this idea of how we should relate to nature. And the idea was that we need to think about nature as something that we can mimic. And we might experiment and test with different things, but nature is in some way the standard. Uh, Barry uh, was in fact cited in Wes Jackson's work as someone who's recommended having a, a conversation with nature. So I think Jackson would look at current agricultural practices, the use of um, pesticides and the way in which soil gets degraded and say, we, we're not really interacting with nature in a systemic way that's producing the best possible outcomes in the long term. So just to hit a few things, some of the problems with industrial agriculture, um, it, the use of pesticides and chemicals, and there's practices now where they modify plants genetically so that they are resistant to herbicides that they want to apply. And then those um, genetically modified plants are intermixing with other plants that are not genetically modified, such that we're perhaps changing the whole ecology in which plants grow. And, and the, there's a threat to the natural version of these plants um, being taken over by the, the genetically modified versions. Then there's just the use of artificial fertilizers. That's very fossil fuel intensive. The runoff from that causes eutrophication and dead zones and different waterways. And obviously all the fossil fuel use of, of driving these big tractors and pulling this really heavy equipment. There's this huge capital investment. You can see in economic downturns, lots of times farmers have gone bankrupt because they have to lay out so much capital for all this expensive equipment. And then mentioned before this soil degradation that some of these industrial practices don't really build up the fertility of the soil in the long run. So there's this logic that we've seen again and again where it's reductive, it's kind of focused on one specific thing. Sometimes um, farmers are obsessed with just one thing like yield and there's this uh, efficiency and control wanting to stamp out any kinds of pests and that kind of stuff. Um, and somebody like Wes Jackson would suggest that uh, we could have perhaps better relationships with uh, nature and better ways of doing agriculture. Okay, so Barry comes in as a social critic, 
Um, he's someone that's looking at current practices and he has some problems with them. And his basic critique is that the market economy functions like a colonial economy. And when we think colonial, we're not thinking about like the American case where the Americans colonized the land. We're thinking about cases where people got colonized. Um, so um, powerful people come in and colonize and subordinate uh, the locals and you get people that are doing the plantation kind of work that aren't really benefiting from it. So there's this distortion of community, it's exploitive. There's not the same caring for land or people that we would hope. Um, and his basic suggestion is that the economy should be grounded more in the local um, situation and the needs of the, the local people. Um, and he really celebrates this self-sufficiency. So you can see some echoes even of like a, a Emerson, but he's certainly not as um, narrowly focused on the individual as Emerson was. Okay, so he's questioning some assumptions about what's profitable and what's efficient, and he wants you to rethink some of the relationship from uh, community to the economy. He's very critical of these uh, institutions and organizations like Walmart that come in and they sell finished goods, but the money is largely getting pulled out of the local economy. Um, it's not nearly as invested in the local economy as, say, uh, Main Street businesses were. Okay, so I've just pulled out a, this is Wendell Berry, and just pulled out a quote here. He's really trying to get you to rethink subsistence. So usually when we think about subsistence farming, we think about some people on just the edge of starvation, eking out the most barest living and um, trying to live off the land, so to speak. But Barry points out that there's some benefits here in that uh, those people that are um, living off the land, so to speak, um, had a certain kind of economy where they could use a lot of the stuff that they made and they interacted with other people in a way that was more um, intimate and interdependent than um, today where we make trips to the store, we might wave at our neighbors, but it's not like we're really doing work together. Okay, so to start with, Barry's focused on this historic community in Kentucky uh, in 1938, um, Port Royal, Kentucky. And um, one way of thinking about this is it's on the eve of the um, the Civil War, Civil War, a few, few centuries off there, on the eve of uh, World War II, um, and it's likely in the Depression. So these are some poor folks. Um, and he situates this uh, through the eyes of Lois uh, flood the the wife of Owen and they're younger members of this community, but it, what I would suggest he's he's presenting this as a working community, uh, in in two senses. One, they it actually did work. Like the community got together, those nine households got together and shared labor uh, for greater efficiency and and fellowship. And he's also suggesting that there's something about that that functioned well. That um, that he thinks it's morally um, superior to the kind of uh, distant um, relationships we have now. So some key facts, he had these interdependent households, these nine households, they pooled their labor, both for work and entertainment. They had a lot of benefits that wouldn't show up on an accounting spreadsheet. So they had a lot of rich local knowledge. They had a lot of um, taking care of each other that wouldn't show up. Um, it saved health care costs, but that's probably what it did. And there was a lot of um, self-providing that went on. <laughs> from time to time people got sick they sneezed a lot they take care of each other um, they'd also play ice cream and cards <laughs> so Barry's point is they could take care of their own needs and um, he has this great quote um, that kind of captures the sentiment here they're never lonesome or bored at least in the, the memory of Lois so pictures here I have like a county courthouse which would be the center of life in a small town or a small county um, and the ideal here of this main street where there's local proprietors selling goods to local people but the economy is local there's people there's money changing hands locally it's not all just going out to a larger corporation okay and then the fall um, it's got kind of a biblical thing. So if you remember Wachtel, Wachtel talk about how modernity dislocates and it uh, makes it hard for a community to really have any, any teeth. So Barry uh, talks about what happened in the post-war economy. You got these better roads. So I have the interstate highway system here, which really transformed the nation um, and interconnected things. Increasing farm income, 
school consolidation. So instead of every little town having their own school, there'd be one regional school. So it kind of undermined that sense of community. A lot of new agriculture technologies. Um, and they went from a subsistence economy to a consumer economy. So instead of trying to meet their own needs, they would grow one or two crops and then sell that to the market um, nationally and internationally. So a lot less um, seeing themselves as specifically making their producing their own goods and a lot more kind of moving in the role of just consumer. And the current community in Point, Port Royal, Port Royal that Barry point out is that it's a community in the sense that there's people that live near each other, but there's not a lot of interconnection or collaboration, certainly not in terms of getting together to do the harvest or getting together to um, um, kill the hogs or something like that. The um, economy is extractive, meaning you take econ uh, you have some county and you're pulling out the um, um, resources from it or the, the commodities that you're growing. So it's not for the rural life or for the local economy. And a lot of negative account, negative externalities are kept off the books. So you might have become a lot more efficient. You don't have a local person making shoes anymore. A lot of jobs have gone to China. So things might cost cheaper because we're importing them from China, but you've lost a lot of local merchants. You've lost a lot of the richness of the local economy. And you get these deaths of despair that we see with the opioid crisis where People are killing themselves with alcohol, drugs, and um, uh, suicide and other things. So, um, and then other things you don't talk about, but are oftentimes the case, uh, using a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of pesticides, there's pollution, um, water quality issues, um, depletion of aquifers. So there's all kinds of things that, um, these negative externalities that are occurring. Just to give you a feel for some of the stuff Barry's talking about, He's writing in the 1980s, but some of the stuff is just coming home to roost now. So in the um, 2020, we're living in an era where there's a lot of these deaths of despair in rural areas. And you can see a lot of them are um, situated here in the, um, the rural area of the Appalachians that um, Barry's writing about. But these alcohol suicides and homicides uh, are on the rise and um, huge increases in the number of drug related deaths in these communities. So some of that you could make the argument is from the changes in the economic uh, conditions of these these localities where they don't have the same kind of uh, rich economies that they used to. Okay, uh, another big change Barry talks about um, just mentions in passing that the changes in the technology that was used in agriculture. So in the 1950s, um, this was the size of tractor that you could have. This was kind of state of the art. Um, but now we live in a world where there's these huge tractors that cover a lot more ground. Um, here's a big disc that um, tills the soil. So the short story is you have this bigger equipment, so you have a lot less need for labor. Um, but that means then there's a lot less people living in these rural economies. And so they kind of become desolate and all these, these towns tend to dry up. All right. And then um, in terms of thinking about... Um, this being an extractive kind of economy, you can think about Walmart as this Main Street killer. So here's a picture of the original Sam Walmart, um, Sam Walton's um, five and 10 dime store. So five and 10, so back in the day, you would buy stuff that just cost five cents or 10 cents. So it was located on Main Street. It was part of this broader ecosystem of shops and whatever. But things have changed drastically. Walmart has become this corporate behemoth um, now um, competing with Amazon to um, provide all your retail needs. And China, using container shipping, has just um, decimated many small towns in terms of um, local merchants producing goods. It's all now situated at, at Walmart. So this is the kind of thing that Barry's talking about when you have these extractive economies. All right, so some key points on 1938 Point Royal community. Um, the what Barry's trying to point out is that the community had many positives. So it had things like um, the goods that were produced, but also the material, the psychological, the spiritual kind of things. One of Barry's key points is he's not sentimental about community. He doesn't want you to value community just because it makes you feel good. He wants to think about the actual work it can do, the way it can change people's lives. 
So he, he suggests that there's some real losses, that the culture that used to have these knowledge and skills built into them is gone. Um, families were a lot more coherent. The community was a lot more coherent. Um, and you had these virtues that he found um, very noteworthy. So just a few instructor's notes here. Um, you should think about that he's a very good writer. And so one thing he does is he sets up the story of these people and then he gives you this gut punch saying that it's all gone. All this community is gone. Um, so he also has a lot of eye for detail. Um, so just he's an example of someone that's a pretty effective writer. I would note, um, and we all have, limitations in the way we frame things you can't talk about everything but there is a sense in which he kind of takes it for granted that people can have access to land and i would suggest that in the south that's somewhat of a white privilege thing given the history of of slavery um and also it the community was really racially homogenous so it might be different nowadays when we have so many different kinds of people um, to imagine that kind of close-knit community uh, at any rate, he's he's not really acknowledging uh, that we live in a more multicultural, diverse society these days. Okay, he also talks about the Amish local community. So he gives the example of um, David Klein, who's also an author. You can find some of his books online. Um, but he compares Klein's farm to the industrial farm. And he goes, he runs through the kind of statistics of what David Klein has on his farm. And you might think about some of this diversity kind of reminds us of Polyface Farm, um, a number of different things. It's a lot more diversified than the typical industrial farm. And there's this great quote that I think captures some of the stuff that Barry's getting at in terms of the, the benefits of this kind of community. So somebody asked Klein what community means to him. And he said, well, you know, in the spring when he was plowing and planting, he could um, look around and see 17 teams on neighboring farms. And he knew that if he was sick, those teams and the men driving them would be working on his farm. So there's a sense of solidarity there that we're all in this together that's a little different than most communities. <coughs> okay. So Barry, one way to think about what Barry's preaching, um, so to speak, is Barry is preaching about um, synergy. So he's trying to say that these natural and human economies um, should be mutually supportive and interlocking. And he imagines a local community that's grounded in um, local production is more resilient. Um, and it's a situation where the, the larger economy can't prey on So the larger economy can't prey on the community because the community is the local economy. And he makes this other point that the local economy is pretty profitable. So he runs through the numbers and the, the key thing is the larger farm can make more money, but it has higher expenses. So it nets, or in other words, if you take profits minus expenses, it only nets $20,000 in a year. Whereas these Amish farms, um, they'd be smaller and they'd make over $100,000 more, and also um, you have more people working on them. So in some sense, you could say, okay, they're less efficient, but in another sense, you could say, well, they support more people, and those people can contribute to the local economy in, a, in other kinds of ways. Then as a side note, just from an ecological perspective, the Amish are using less fossil fuels, right, because they're using horses. Um, they can feed the horses with the crops they grow, and the, the horses manure can be worked back into the land as fertilizer. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we have here, I um, want you to watch a little video from the movie Witness. Um, it shows an Amish barn raising, and it does a pretty good job of showing you a lot of interesting details. Um, the link for this is in the description below, but you can also... Um, track it down if you just search for this and that's how many minutes long it is the background this is an old movie but there's this new york cop that's chasing um this criminal and there's somebody who witnessed it in the amish community a little kid and so he lives with the amish for a while um trying to hide out from the corrupt police or whatever um, but the short story is he's working on a case and he gets romantically interested in one of the amish women and there's this romantic love triangle so here's some questions I want you to think about as you watch the, the video. 
and then we can talk about it um, after you've done. It's really good. So I really encourage you to take a second here and watch it. I will be waiting when you come back. Okay, so just in terms of these questions, um, it's interesting in terms of how they raise the barn and that there's not somebody with an architecture degree. It's an elder in the community that has some expertise because it was handed down to him. There's certain synergies. In other words, the laborers aren't paid. Um, there's just a mutual understanding that when somebody needs to have a barn raised, that everyone will come and help. Um, and the way childcare is provided, it's interesting. Um, the kids are learning specific skills. So you can see the little boys are learning how to hammer. You can think about the production process in terms of how efficient it is. And the one, on the one hand, it takes a lot of people to raise the barn, but on the other hand, they can raise a whole barn in a day. So there is a certain kind of efficiency there that comes from the hive-like structure of the community where um, there's a lot more solidarity and shared labor. Um, you might notice that the work um, ha goes some distance towards mitigating the romantic conflict. It's hard to hate somebody who you're sharing lemonade with. Um, so it, there's a way in which that work and that shared purpose um, can mitigate some conflict. Um, the construction is pretty carbon friendly, right? Um, you're not using power tools and big equipment. Um, there is obviously on the uh, maybe the side that some of us wouldn't be as happy with some restrictions on individualism, some clear gender roles certain kinds of work you can do. You're not going to be a film designer in this kind of community. And then um, Harrison Ford, uh, his character presents a threat because um, if he were to marry this woman, that woman would leave the community. She would, in essence, become dead to that community. Um, so there's these really bright, thick lines between that community and any outsiders. Okay. So a few other concepts related to this, um, but Barry's talking about in terms of this rich local economy, um, you see people, advocates of locally owned businesses talking about as the multiplier effect. So if you spend a dollar at a local business, that's gonna get reinvested in your community or, or is much more likely to be the case. Whereas if you spend money at a corporate chain, most of that money is gonna um, be left, leave the community and go to shareholders and profits. So in other words, there's this feedback where if you're shopping locally and owning stuff locally, you get a richer, more vibrant um, local economy that can do more work um, and employ more people, present more economic opportunities, all that kind of stuff. All right. So wanted to also step away from Barry for a moment and talk a little more broadly about this, um, what we might call the potential for solidarity. So uh, there's a new book that just came out by Robert Putnam, who is a famous um, public policy guy at Harvard. And um, we are, we're going to talk about some of his findings in this most recent book. So, but just to recap where we are, subsistence economies um, provide for local needs, whereas uh, consumer economies are oriented towards the global economy. So the subsistence, uh, there's less surplus. You're going to make less money, so to speak, but in some ways they're more resilient because there's these denser local connections that can buffer you against the vagaries of the national economy. The Amish are similar in some ways and they have that this labor intensive model. They're less reliant on the broader economy. There's a lot more mutual aid. There's lower costs, this sense that they take care of each other if they get sick. And um, you have a lot of social capital, maybe not economic capital. So what do I mean by social capital? Well, that's the sets of relationships and networks among people that can do stuff, that can produce economic value, that can educate people, that can pass on knowledge. Robert Putnam um, in 2000 wrote about this in the book called Bowling Alone, and there's been this huge decline in social capital since the 1950s. Putnam's more recent book uh, with co-author Garrett um, looks at the tendency we have to think of ourselves versus we or I in the most simplistic term. So Putnam's writing is a communitarian. So he's somebody that you could consider as a liberal, but he's a little more concerned about the common good um, versus just individual initiative than maybe a typical liberal. Okay, so his basic argument is if you look at social solidarity, uh, 
there's been this pattern where in the what was called the Gilded Age back in the 1890s to 1910, you had a lot of similarities to now, a lot of differences in income and wealth inequality and income inequality. People tend to think about themselves as individuals. And then you have this upswing to the 1960s where there's a lot of census that we're all in this together. And he goes to great pains to show that even for your minority groups, say African Americans and women, that they too participated in this upswing. So it wasn't just a white guy thing. It was the, the gains were broader than that. Now, obviously that they weren't as broad and there was still a lot of um, limitation of opportunities for African Americans and women, but it's not as if this, we going from I to we made the situation worse for those people. It still made it better. Um, and we don't have time to go into all the details of this, but he's looking at the different levels of trust and sharing and caring and donating and joining. There's a wide number of things that go into plotting these data points. And since the 1960s, there's been this gradual loss of that to the point now where it's much more focused on I. Okay, so just a few other slides that flush this out a little bit. Um, we're living in an era where there's a lot of inequality and back in the 1950s and 1960s there was this, what was called the Great Compression from World War II to say 1970 where you had a, a, a really um, compression of incomes and wealth such that uh, we were kind of all in the same boat. There wasn't these huge gaps between rich and poor that we see today. So inequality was here, became more equal, now we've become more unequal. So one of the things that he looks at is the cultural salience of this concept of identity, about the, the me versus the we. So he looked at um, the use of the term identity um, in a, a Google search where you look over different kinds of writings over the, the decades. And there's just been this drastic increase in the extent to which people are concerned about identity. <clears throat> um, and there's also been uh, this um, U inverse U here in terms of deaths of despair. So the suicides and drug deaths and all that, um, that has gone up a lot recently. So I'll just to plug another book here, um, Jacob Hacker um, has a book called The Great Risk Shift, where he talks about there's this shift in which public institutions um, used to take care of people more collectively and that has been shifted more to just be on the individual. So. Just two quick examples. Um, used to have a pension that would pay a set amount um, as long as you lived. So pensions have been converted to 401ks. So they're more dependent upon you just picking the right stocks and what the market does. You're not guaranteed anything. Similarly with education, you used to have a sense that education was this public good that we we're all buying into that together. Whereas now it's much more become an individual responsibility and we expect individuals to go into debt to go to college. So the social safety net has become frayed. So the key points from this Putnam perspective, Putnam and Garrett, is that we used to have, the, the, what happened in the upswing is there was this, the progressives, the certain group of um, people back in the 19, uh, starting in the 1890s, really worked to change society. And there was a high school movement. So high schools didn't always exist. There was this large effort to create them um, and improve the lives of people all over the country with better education. And then also labor unions. There was this work to organize labor to have a countervailing force to capital. And that really, most people that are experts in this has, suggest that had a huge impact on um, sharing um, the economic prosperity more broadly. So those are examples of some engines, these institutions that made a difference. Um, and then a number of things happened, but one thing, there was a backlash against the civil rights movement. People became more inclined to think about us versus them and that helped undermine that solidarity. Um, but one, one of their key points is the economy is always grounded in politics or in the community. So in other words, you don't just have the economy doing its thing. The economy is based on the different kinds of political decisions that are made. So one key thing here is the extent to which the society invests in education and that can make a huge difference. Or the internet came out of government investment in research and development in different universities and that's transformed things and created all kinds of opportunities. So um, 
they're making this point that those two things are always tightly tied together. So the basic point is posterity is more likely when you have this broad solidarity to build on. And just to, it reminds me of, there's this late senator from Minnesota called Paul Wellstone, um, who was a progressive. He, and one of his phrases was, we all do better when we all do better. So that, in other words, it suggests that if we can see other people benefiting as helping us, we're inclined to enact policies that, that have more leverage. All right, and then last, I wanna hit just a few sustainable agricultural practices. We've looked at, back in the day, we looked at Wes Jackson and his idea of um, not monoculture agriculture, but polyculture agriculture. And we've looked at the um, polyface farm and the idea of pig raters and raking houses and these different kinds of systems that um, take advantage of the properties of animals and nature to create more synergy and a richer kind of set of interactions that um, have better effects for the economy, excuse me, better effects for ecology and that are still quite profitable. Um, going to highlight one other kind of approach to this um, called regenerative agriculture. And it's similar into some of Barry's stuff in that it's really trying to focus on the local conditions and to improve things uh, as much as possible in the on the ground, so to speak, through um, different kinds of synergies and smart investments. So you're looking to add value for the long term. And there's a psychological shift that's involved where instead of trying to control nature, you're trying to work with nature. And one of the things you can achieve, for example, is some better practices that create better carbon sinks. So in other words, in this video I'm going to have you watch, they'll talk about how you, you can have cattle management practices that enable you to um, capture more carbon um, and decrease uh, the forces of global warming. So the link is below. Um, and if you if it's for some reason not there, uh, you can Google this or um, type this into to YouTube to find the video. You watch the video. Um, look at these questions I've outlined for you here um, in terms of things you should pay attention to and pull out of the video. So I'm going to pause here while you uh, watch the video and then we'll talk about it for a little bit. Okay, so you should have gotten from that um, several things. They talked about three specific kinds of broad practices that they can do. Um, talked about tilling can be destructive to the organisms that live in the soil and make it a, um, a rich environment for growing crops. Cover crops present an alternative for that and that provide organic matter um, that reinforces that as opposed to working against it. Um, cows can sequester carbon in terms of allowing grasses to reach their full height. Um, so if cows are moved to different paddocks like they did on Polyface Farm, you get grasses growing taller and sucking more carbon out of the air. And this whole process builds more organic matter in the soil as they go. And they also talk about these food so forests. So in other words, setting up a set, a set of kind of relationships of elements within the forest so that you're um, growing more food than you would otherwise. And these are obviously perennials um, that are producing fruits and different kinds of things and you're not having to, to replant stuff every year. So, and then you should have gotten that what you're trying to create in this regenerative agriculture is, is all these sets of relationships. You're not doing just one thing. You're not doing monoculture, but you're trying to create this more um, integrated, diverse, um, rich kind of network of life that produces more goods in the long run. Okay, that is it for the lecture. I hope you enjoyed and learned something and uh, appreciate you listening. Okay, bye-bye.